Hey everyone, welcome to Analysis in Chains. Nathan here. Before we get into today's interview, I uh, wanted to just mention the drama and the news that's been going around the cryptoverse because it's impossible for us to just ignore it and go on with things as normal. Um, it was rather uh, an interesting drama that has been playing out. Binance has decided to delist Bitcoin Satoshi's vision or uh, BCSV or whatever. Um, so what's gone on is that there's a computer scientist by the name of Craig Wright, an Australian fellow who has claimed that he is Satoshi Nakamoto. He's offered no proof of this. Uh, he is, uh, uh he's very adamant that uh, it is him. And he started a project about a year ago called Bitcoin Satoshi's vision. And the, the idea was they forked Bitcoin Cash into a new uh, into a, a new coin, but it would only be uh, it would only scale based on the size of the blocks. So the blocks would get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, it obviously comes with some problems. Uh, you know, if you get to a terabyte block size, it means only big server farms can do it. You can't you know run. Bitcoin Satoshi's vision on your home computer if the blocks are big. Um, there are also some issues of many people have accused Craig Wright of being a serial liar. That you know, he says he's Satoshi but offers no proof. Uh, that he uh, could easily just move some coins from the wallets known to be owned by Satoshi but he doesn't and blah blah blah. Anyway, what's gone on is that he started sending out threats of lawsuits for to news agencies to random individuals uh who who said no he's not satoshi and the founder of binance the largest or most well-known exchange i guess between that and coinbase but uh binance threatened to delist bcsv uh, from their exchange, so that meaning that people can uh, wouldn't be able to exchange their bitcoins for Bitcoin Satoshi's vision, BC, uh, BCSV, on Binance, and so that's a large uh, um, avenue closed off to that coin. And of course, uh, when they decided and went through with it and delisted them, the price fell through the floor, and so. It's a fun drama to watch, but it does bring up really interesting questions. Questions like, how centralized is cryptocurrency in general if one, um, if one exchange has the power to put an end to, uh, uh to a cryptocurrency project like Satoshi's Vision? Um, just by delisting them. And, that's a, and and if they didn't have that power or what have you, then does that let unscrupulous people who are you know uh, not living up to perhaps the standards of the community and who are pushing fraud, uh, potentially fraudulent projects run rampant? Where is the balance between centralization and proper governance of a system? Don't have an answer, but uh, that's the interesting drama that's gone on today. So now, on a completely different note, we've got a interview for you that I did uh, because uh, I wanted to talk with. Uh, I, I've done interviews since we started this podcast, and I, I, I've started the podcast partly to meet so many interesting people in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. And today, I had a chance to talk with one of the uh, one of the members of Harmony. Harmony is a primary layer protocol, and they're they're looking to solve the scalability problem not just by increasing block size, but by doing different things. And so now we can talk with uh, Nick White and find out how it works. And one last thing before I let you go is that uh, you may have also noticed that we've uh, started moving to a one episode a week format. It's going to be this way for a while. We'll see how it goes. 
Um, but the, the two episodes a week was starting to become, uh, a lot of work. And so for Neil and I, it's been harder and harder to find time with my main project, Mind Spider. It's starting to get more and more traction. And so I'm having less and less time to record. Uh, but we want to keep this going and, uh, we, we really do love our podcast and, uh, we love having everyone, uh, talk about the episodes and listen to us, uh, on the telegram afterwards. And so, um, we're, what we're doing is we're going to move to this one episode a week format and see how that goes. So without further ado, enjoy the rest of the show. This is the Analysis in Chains with Nathan Williams and Neil Kieran. <laughs> Welcome to Analysis in Chains. I'm Nathan Williams. Joining me today is Nick White, the co-founder of Harmony. Nick, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, it's great to be joining the podcast and excited to talk about what Harmony is doing with everyone out there. Absolutely. So as I understand it, Harmony is a base layer protocol that is looking to increase scalability through sharding and through a proof of stake algorithm. That's, uh, that's basically it. You guys got some smart contracts going, uh, but it's, it's a base layer protocol. Yeah, Harmony is a layer one protocol and our you know, main goal is to provide scalability and also to reduce costs. So that way, you know, we, we see that there's enormous potential in blockchain um, for all these new exciting applications to be built, but um, there, there are two missing pieces. One is that if you do reach scale with a decentralized application, you often run into congestion and sort of the upper bounds of what the underlying protocol is capable of supporting. And the second piece is that it can be too expensive. and um, that limits the kinds of use cases that you can imagine. So we want our, our cost per transaction to be dramatically lower um, than existing solutions. And we want to have the ability to scale up if applications grow with users and demand. So tell me, how is this different, uh, fundamentally different than EOS? So um, EOS is, um, you know, they do what's called DPoS or delegated proof of stake, in, in which there are only 21 block producers. I mean, there's only really 21 nodes that are running the consensus algorithm. Um, that enables them to scale because essentially, actually, by having the network more decentralized, you have to do more coordination between more parties, which means mm -hmm. more, you know, more. It's sort of like getting, you know, a jury of uh, a thousand people to come to an agreement. Right to make a verdict versus a, a jury of just jury of 21. let's say you know, 21. Right, it's much easier to uh, come to consensus. But the the problem is that then you sacrifice decentralization, both in the fact that a there's only 21 parties with power, um, and, and so it's easier for them to sort of collude with one another. You're also making the cost the machines themselves. If you're going to be one of those 21 block producers, your machine has to be very very powerful. So it's very capital intensive. So it kind of keeps most of the the people who are more mom and pop kind of level from participating. And at, at Harmony, um, it's very different. So we, we really uh, value decentralization. It's not just some sort of, you know, fancy concept or you know, it's not a nice to have. I really think that decentralization is one of the you know main killer uh, aspects of blockchain. Uh, an undecentralized blockchain is almost kind of like an oxymoron. We feel after doing tons and tons of research that the best way to scale but maintain decentralization is through a technique called sharding. And I'm sure people have probably heard all about sharding in the last year. It's been a popular topic, but uh, maybe maybe we could just go over it briefly. Yeah, for sure. So I think I think uh, it's not a it's not a it's actually a pretty straightforward concept um, if it's explained in the right way. But I think oftentimes, as, as it is with tech, you know, it's either explained in not a very simple way or Maybe someone who doesn't really understand it themselves, you know, explains it and people just get confused because it just sounds fancy, right? But sharding is pretty straightforward. Essentially, the concept of sharding is, you know, shard of something, like if you think of like a, a bowl, if you broke it, split it into shards, each one of those pieces forms a greater whole, but the, the bowl or the, the, the overall structure is split into sub 
components. And so what sharding does in the blockchain context is it enables you to have a cohesive overarching network that's doing the same functions as, as let's just say a simple blockchain like Bitcoin, but it, it's uh, split into smaller subgroups. And in that way, um, each subgroup is kind of running its own uh, chain. And those chains can talk to each other. Uh, the whole idea then is that you can parallelize the validation of transactions going through the network. And so each, let's say each uh, shard, you know, can do, let's say, 100 tra transactions per second. You can continue to add shards as you have more computers joining the network. And so let's say you needed to do 10,000 transactions per second and each shard is, you know, contributing about 100 transactions per second, then you'll need about 100 shards to achieve that. And what you get is what's called linear scalability, meaning that more the more machines, the more throughput. You don't end up with this sort of upper bound or this bottleneck that let's say Bitcoin and Ethereum have. And even actually protocols like EOS or others that don't do sharding, they will always run into an upper bound through past which they can't scale because it's just the physical limitation of not not being able to split up and parallelize the network. There's always a trade-off whenever you make a design decision in a, in a blockchain. And so, you know, where, uh, what Bitcoin did, it solved a, uh, a problem in a very elegant way by having everybody work on one version of truth or one version of, uh, of this ledger uh, and, and come to consensus on it with proof of work. And it wastes a lot of electricity, but it is the sort of grandfather uh, flagship product of blockchain. Now, when you're dealing with sharding, you're essentially saying, well, we're taking a bunch of different shards or a bunch of different pieces of the blockchain when people will just work on them separately and then we'll stitch them together at the end in some way, I, I, I imagine. And But the question is, if there's a smaller subset group working on a shard, is it less secure? Are you trading off the security of having millions of computers all working on one ledger uh, to have like a hundred computers working on one ledger and it, does that uh, create a risk of vulnerability that's a really good question in fact that has been one of the biggest sort of questions open questions and sharding the solution that everyone has kind of arrived on is what's called representative sharding to sort of dial back a bit you can imagine sort of one of the attacks on a sharded network is that, you know, rather than having to attack the overall network like you would in a 51% uh, attack of Bitcoin, let's say Bitcoin, let's just, I think people are probably more familiar with proof of work. Let's say the Bitcoin network was split into 10 different shards. Then all of a sudden, rather than having to do a 51% attack if, uh, on the network, you could just pick on one shard, right? And, um, and just do a bunch of proof of work there and start double spending and doing all these bad things. Um, so in, in, a, uh, in a sharded network, that's, that's a common problem is a, is a single shard overtake attack. And um, the way that you combat that is you do what's called representative sharding, meaning that everyone still uh, does proof of work or, or they all stake in the same pool, which is sort of like the, the, main, the main chain, sort of like the, the home place where everyone you know, puts in their, the, wherever the civil resistance is coordinated through that one chain. And then everyone is randomly um, distributed into the, the shards according to that um, sort of main chain um, civil sort of uh, mechanism. So what that, and when I see the, the importance of the randomness is that then everyone, if, if the shards are large enough, there are enough participants then the, the statistical uh, representation of malicious people to um, honest nodes within a given shard will be the same as, the, as it is for the overall uh, network. So um, to, to sort of like explain that a little bit better, it's sort of like, um, you know, if you, hmm, what's, what's a good, it's, it's sort of like a, um, the more, let's, it, it makes it hard to coordinate an attack, I would imagine, if you are randomly choosing which shard each dif uh, each actor participates in, or each uh, each computer. 
And so, uh, if uh, whereas if everyone was in one shard, or if everyone got to choose their shard, or if there was uh, a certain amount of predictability in which shard people would be in, it would be much easier to, to coordinate the shard takeover. Would that be accurate? Yeah, yeah, and it's and and yeah, and for that reason, it's so w one of the main um, sort of variables that that uh, determines how secure or how statistically re representative a given shard is of the whole is the number of samples. So let's say that that means the number of nodes in a given shard. So let's say there are you know let's say let's take an example that there are ten thousand nodes, and they're twenty percent malicious and eighty percent honest. If our shard is only, you know, the size of 10 nodes per shard, then there's actually a very high probability that I can sample 10 nodes out of that 10,000 node distribution. And, you know, it's one fifth each time, but one fifth to the 10th, there's, that's actually like a pretty high probability that I'll get a fully, you know, malicious shard. Um, and that's a, that's a real problem. So instead what we do is we increase that number in our case to 600. But so that now, like, let's say you had 20% malicious, um, if you had to, you know, choose, you know, 600 malicious nodes out of that sample distribution, it, it will be very, very unlikely for you to reach that threshold. So that's why having larger shards makes it more representative of the overall network. And that's how you maintain security. Um, so long as that sampling process is truly random. Uh, that makes total sense. And I can see, like, well, like we've talked to a number of uh, different base layer protocols who are all dealing with sort of different aspects of attempting to maintain decentralization. And as I understand it, decentralization is quite an important value in Harmony's protocol, right? Um, now, one thing I've uh, uh, that's always been a question in my mind, though, is that the more decentralized a protocol seems to be, the more vulnerable it tends to be to off-chain disinformation. So, for example, if you look at the epitome of what people think about uh, blockchain, which is Bitcoin, you've had fork after fork after fork because you have politics coming into play and different groups of miners saying, well, we want to uh, increase the size to, uh, to two megabytes or four megabytes, or we uh, want to, uh, to uh, have uh, seg seg segwit, segmented witness and, uh, and different ways of increasing throughput or increasing block size. And there's disagreement and someone comes along and claims to be Satoshi and of course, he's a serial liar and uh, sways people to go. <laughs> <laughs> very Not subtle, naming very any subtle. names, but <laughs> and I don't know what you're talking about. And uh, and in and in the end, uh, it ends up because it's so decentralized. It ends up in a way being more vulnerable to centralized or coordinated uh, informational attacks that are off the chain. And I'm wondering how. Uh, is is this something that you, you're thinking about at Harmony, or is this sort of a problem for once you get big, or for for tomorrow Harmony? Uh, yeah, well, I think you know that? that you're you're kind of going towards the question of governance, right? And um, I think governance is a really important topic, yeah. and there's some really interesting protocols who have um, established and demonstrated the the, the validity of, of certain different kinds of models. Um, I'm especially a fan of Decred. I think that they have a really interesting um, approach to governance. Um, and I think, but I think, yeah, Decred, if you've, Decred? If you've heard of them. Um, uh, I, I haven't been in contact, no, uh, but maybe maybe you could just uh, uh, tell me a little bit about their governance model. I guess they're another... Yeah, so the, um, they, yeah, so they, an, they do uh, a, a, a blended proof of work and proof of stake. And um, basically you get what's these like voting shares. Um, so every, every round you get a certain number of shares and then when there's a vote, you can sort of cast those shares. But also they have this cool thing called Politeia, which is like a decentralized Reddit that's censorship, censorship resistant. Um, and maybe it's also the fact that just their community is very engaged, but they've had really good results so far with making community decisions around how to spend foundation tokens and how to um, you know, make make decisions co sort of coordinated across the network. So they're really cool. But I but I actually think of governance. I mean, at the end of the day, on chain governance is a, is a tool, 
but you, there's always the fallback of, I mean, off-chain governance is, is sort of like, it is the, the bottom, uh, it, 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 it always is there, you, you never escape it. And in many ways, it's sort of its own market mechanism in that, um, you know, when Bitcoin kind of goes through a hard fork, it's, it's, it's basically the community trying to, uh, you know, trying to, it's, it's discovering how it should really evolve. In the end, like if there's a, if there's a fork and there's a sort of split, um, in the end, I think one chain will, will win over the other, or maybe they'll both coexist and maybe they each have different niches to occupy. So to me, I think the threat of forking is sort of actually part of the killer app of blockchain that, um, you know, it's part of open development. It's part of the fact that every, all the users have their own say, right? They don't, they're not locked into any given protocol. They can always, you know, opt out or opt in. Um, and, and it, although I do think that in many, for, for many, you know, less kind of high stakes, uh, decisions, it makes sense to have some form of on-chain governance. Um, and, and so we're, we're looking closely at, at models like Decred and having some sort of on, on, uh, on-chain voting mechanism for that, um, and ways in which we can, you know, decide as a community, what kind of upgrades to enable, uh, how to spend, um, tokens in the foundation, et cetera. Hmm. I guess it sort of always comes back to this question of uh, of what the role of decentralization is. You know, the, the the original vision of decentralization was just removing a middleman that was uh, that had a lot of power that people didn't especially want to trust, namely a central bank. And uh, although that's evolved over time to 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 mean a vision of sort of a perfect democracy or a direct democracy over the governance of a chain um but when once you get into uh requiring off-chain governance which as you said you can't really escape the question is well do you then need some sort of centralized entity anyway in order to manage the off-chain governance aspect or can this continue to be decentralized and sort of what is the role of the community when not everyone in the community has equal access to information to help govern. And I think that's going to be something maybe that uh, that base layer protocols are going to wrestle with till the end of time. Who do you trust mm, to make mm, the decisions? That's true. And I, I think it'll be a gradual process because, um, you know, like it or not, the founding team for any protocol um, will have sort of a special place um, within the community. and with more decision making power whether or not that's you know actual decision making power with their physical tokens or whether that's just the fact that they are the founder and in many ways uh, you know they're, they're the, the figureheads of that protocol as time goes on that will sort of uh, i guess diffuse and um, dilute hopefully uh, it can be more i guess uh, yeah decentralized and more more mer- meritocratic um, and, and new leaders can emerge, but I think that's that's pretty far in the future. I think for now, um, most most you know uh, founding teams of, of any blockchain protocol are, are still they they necessarily need to be very involved because they're still at such early stages of building out these networks. So, what is the vision that your team has for Harmony? What's sort of like your long-term star that you're sailing toward? Our long-term star is uh, to decentralize data. And it, it comes from uh, many of our backgrounds actually before getting into blockchain uh, was in AI. Um, I, myself actually studied AI at Stanford uh, and got my bachelor's and master's there um, and worked at an AI incubator and VC fund before uh, starting a, a, to work at Harmony. And the thing that I saw in the world of AI, it's very exciting and it's, it's amazing technology and I think it is really something that's going to change the world. Um, but I just wasn't convinced that it would change the world in the way that I wanted to in its current manifestation. And what I was seeing was that uh, AI is a very, it's a, it's a technology that frankly centralizes power um, because it has sort of this feedback reinforcement loop of the more data you have, the better algorithms you can train. And then the more, the better product you can make and the more data you can get, the more money you can make, so on and so forth. And I think we're seeing that play out before our eyes with a lot of these big tech companies. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's really becoming a, a much more 
mainstream uh, topic of conversation. Um, and and so and I, and I was even also seeing this with the entrepreneurs I was working with um, at, at our incubator, um, and and it was that they couldn't really compete. You know, they, they, there wasn't really the, the opportunity for some new, you know, visionary to come along and unseat the current incumbents. It, the best thing you could do was, you know, get acquired or, you know, if you don't get acquired, then they could just imitate what you're building and do it much better and much faster um, because of their advantages of data and resources and, and also talent. So um, that was something that I was seeing and I, it, was, it was frustrating and I, I, I just felt that we were kind of stuck in a paradigm that was just going to continue to concentrate power and wealth. And Do you um, think that there's a possibility that this is going to bleed over into blockchain as well? I mean, we're already hmm. seeing the corporates come into the come into the space. Yeah, I think, you know, that's it's not going to you know there, there's a great article that I uh, read a while back that helped me think about this uh, question and it's about um, incremental uh, decentralization versus like you know overnight uh I, I i'm not i'm not remembering the exact phrase but essentially the point is that you know decentralization is not something that we're going to get to um overnight it's going to take us a while to get there and it's going to be an incremental process and you know the power is not just going to you know re reassemble itself and reorganize uh within you know the next five to ten years it's going to take much longer and, um, but I do feel that blockchain will inevitably restructure um, sort of the, the power structures around data and wealth and, and even political power itself. So um, it, it, to me, it seems like an inevitability, but um, it's not gonna happen immediately. Um, and, and, and there will be sort of this in-between phase where perhaps large corporates are, are entering the space and you know, extracting as much value as they can. And I actually think that's a necessary part of the transition. Um, and that actually signals well for the space as a whole. It's interesting. Uh, I have long since forgotten who I heard this from, but I remember hearing someone say in a panel discussion once that the average person doesn't care about decentralization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They care about properly managed and governed infrastructure. And in a way, I, it does make me wonder for the future of decentralization if the average person just cares that they receive a good service and, uh, and how it's delivered to them, how the sausage is made per se, uh, it remains behind a black box. Yeah, to some degree, but I think that changes when there's actually financial incentives involved. Um, and I think that's sort of, so when I talk about decent democratizing our data, the, 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 the vision that we have is a world in which, you know, data is user owned and user operated. Um, and in, in such a structure, you can actually then generate income based on, you know, monetizing your own data. It's no longer Google or Facebook's data to monetize on your, you know, for their own benefit. Um, it becomes your data that you own, you have sovereignty over it. And that's what we mean by democratizing it. And I think people will, will actually care tremendously about that because, you know, all of a sudden it's not going to be all these, you know, fat cats, tech fat cats who, who are extracting all the money from this new information age. Um, it'll be, you know, actually the, the, the users themselves who can then benefit. And, and it, it's, it's so much deeper even, I think, than just, you know, when we talk about data today, it, it, it's so much focused around these consumer apps like Facebook or even, uh, you know, Instagram or or Google, it, it, there, there's going to be, you know, a whole different layer of this that, you know, let's let's talk about health records. I think those are that may be sort of the longest time coming because the health, you know, it, it's always so, somewhat kind of uh, uh, th those those guys are very conservative and slow moving. But imagine, you know, a, a, that's a bit of age and a, <laughs> imagine in the future, in the long range future, an age when uh, and I also think it'll happen in different jurisdictions faster. I think the U.S. Is, tends to be very conservative when it comes to uh, health records. Um, but anyway, imagine a future where I get my genome sequenced and, and I can submit it to sort of this uh, blockchain infrastructure in which, you know, it can be used for research. It can be used to create new models of diagnosing disease. And it can, and I can get compensated for that because I'm actually helping to, do, you know, helping other people. 
you know, the data, hmm. it, 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 it's also, it's also what's called a non-competitive uh, resource is like an economic term for it. And what that means is that um, your data, like it doesn't, having more data actually doesn't decrease the value of it. So like, let's say I have my genome data and you have your genome data. If I'm trying to sell it to someone mm -hmm. and I sell mine before you do, but let's say, let's take an example, so if it's a sandwich, right? If I sell my sandwich to someone else, they're probably not going to buy the sandwich that you have, right? Because they're like, I already have a sandwich. Because they're I'm, hungry. I'm not hungry anymore. Yeah. <laughs> data is actually the exact opposite in many cases. The more data that, you know, an end user or the consumer, the person, let's say the, the guy building the model, the machine learning model gets, the more valuable each piece of data becomes. And so it's a non-competitive asset. And um, that's kind of the, the, the beauty and kind of the mind-bending aspect of it. Um, and so we can all really benefit from this kind of open data ecosystem. And I think blockchain will be the foundation for this. So what can we expect from Harmony going forward in the next three to six months? Yeah, so Harmony, um, we recently launched a new testnet in which um, there's open mining so people can download the software and connect to the network. Um, and we, we encourage people to come and try it out. Um, and we're building up to mainnet um, this June so we have a lot of really exciting announcements there and um, we're engaging with lots of uh, partners in lots of different domains whether that's in open finance or in energy or education records all different kinds of applications um, and so some of those announcements will be um, coming out but we're really excited to launch the mainnet and actually have um, you know a, a network that is operational and we're really looking forward to demonstrating the fact that using proof of stake and using sharding, we can actually build a network that is much more functional because, you know, if we're going to realize this vision of democratized data and really all the different things that blockchain can create, we need to have a blockchain infrastructure that scales and that is actually cost efficient. And so we're looking forward to, you know, demonstrating that to the world for real and no longer, you know, just claiming things. I think blockchain has been way too much about hype and, that, and that's been healthy because it's helped people fundraise and, and we wouldn't be here uh, today if it weren't for the fact that people believed um, in the potential but um, there's been so much talk and so little walk and so we're really excited to be one of the teams that demonstrates that it's not just all talk and I think all good things take time so the launch of the mainnet is really just the beginning and there's there's so many more years to come in terms of building at building out, you know, effective use cases and building out sort of the, this decentralized sort of app ecosystem, and thereby creating sort of this data layer that then can be uh, democratized and, and monetized, and, and that's sort of like the long, the long way. That's how we envision getting to this democratized data um, future. Hmm. Well, it sounds very exciting. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, and uh, Nick White, the co-founder of Harmony, you can find out more on their website at harmony.one. That's H-A-R-M-O-N-Y dot O-N-E. And uh, best of luck in your mainnet launch coming up in June. Thank you very much, Nathan. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. Um, please uh, track us down on Twitter and on our Discord. Um, we're in open development, so you can come talk to us if you're interested in learning about the technology. We also have a forum which is harmony.one's a uh, talk.harmony.one where you can ask us all different kinds of questions hmm. and uh yeah we look forward to engaging with you guys and once again nathan thank you so much it's been a pleasure talking to you <laughs> all the best